All righty. Well, thank you for joining us for the Demystifying Intellectual Property webinar. It is in partnership with uh, CVOEO's Financial Futures Program and Vermont Law and Graduate School. Just uh, running through some quick housekeeping. We're recording this workshop. Please mute yourself when you're not speaking. Um, if you have questions, just throw them in the chat. I will be monitoring it and making sure that they get answered. Um, and after the workshop, I'll be sending out an email with contact information for our program, for BT Law School, and uh, links and resources. Pass it off to Simeon Geigel. Great. Thank you, Sophia. So that just like to give people an introduction very quickly to the Micro Business Development Program. We are a statewide program that works with low to moderate income Vermonters to help them start or expand a business. There is no fee for our services that uh, for those that qualify, uh, and qualification is based on eligibility, the total household for the income versus uh, the number of people in the household. If you'd like to learn more about our program and to learn if you qualify, please feel free to reach out to myself, John Gurgley, or Pacific Sangayuva, and you can see our phone numbers with extensions and emails below. As I mentioned, the Micro Business Development Program is a statewide program. There's a total of five micro businesses around the state. Each micro business oversees a certain set of counties or territories, and you can see from the list here which uh, program covers which counties and the contacts for each program. You can also see our uh, statewide microbusiness mbdp.org website below where you can find this information and more information. I do like to let folks know about uh, their support for businesses. Uh, this is a bit more specific to the um, to the northwest of Vermont, but some of these organizations uh, also work across the state. Uh, in the uh, Burlington area, we have the uh, Burlington's Business and Workforce Development Department. There is also the Center for Women in Enterprise, Mercy Connections, which operates the Women's Small Business Program, the Vermont Small Business Development Center, SBDC. Uh, there's the Small Business Administration, as well as Champlain Valley Score, and you can see the uh, the website uh, links below, and these will also be included in the slides that Sophia will send out. So finally, I'd like to get to the reason why we're all here today, and I'd like to welcome our presenters. We have uh, Nicole Killerman, uh, Killeron, excuse me, is that correct, Nicole? Killeron, no Killeron. worries. Killeron, sorry. <laughs> Nicole Kaloran, the Professor of Law and Director for the Vermont Law School and Entrepreneurial uh, Legal Lab. We've got Oliver Goodenough, uh, CCO, Research Professor of Law and Author and Researcher, and Devin Brennan, Student, and Callum LaFrance, a student with the Vermont uh, Law School. So thank you so much for taking the time to present today. Uh, I'm really interested in this in this topic, um, especially. So I'm really looking forward to learning more about intellectual property uh, on a personal level, but, but also I work with a number of folks, especially artists. And I know that there are always questions from artists around how do I protect my work? Uh, and I know that there's going to be a lot of other great stuff in here that um, I don't know yet, which I can take forward and help others understand more about and connect them with your services, of course. So thank you very much and, and welcome. Excellent. Thanks very much for the welcome, Simeon. Um, I'm going to hand it right off to uh, what I call our intellectual property expert on our team, Oliver Goodenough. Take it away, Professor Goodenough. Thank you so much, P P Professor Kaloran. And thank you uh, for hosting us for this, this, this webinar. Um, Intellectual property, uh, we're, we call this demystifying, this talk demystifying, because for many people, it is a bit of a mystery. What does it do? Um, um, uh, there's a number of different flavors. What, 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 are, what do they protect? How does it protect? How, how can it help me? What do I have to worry about? And two introductory concepts. One of them is that there are within intellectual property what I call the big four. Uh, the, there, there are some other other uh, bits and pieces to it, but much of what we think of when we think of intellectual property falls into these four subject matter um, uh, buckets. And it's useful in some ways to think about them as different buckets, different different uh, 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 containers of some kind, because each of them really deals with a different kind of material. 
and that uh, and a different set of rules. And there is a little bit of overlap, but basically they are, are, are separable and keeping that separation in your mind as we go forward, I think will be useful because each one of these has characteristics, has what it covers, has the rights it gives, has the exceptions. There's some, as I say, some overlap we'll see on, on concepts like fair use or, and other things as we go forward. But basically uh, there is a, um, a, 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 a separation in these four. And the four are copyright, copyright, copyright covers works of authorship, um, uh, fixed in a tangible medium of expression. It is essentially about the things we think of as, as expressive uh, work, writing, film, art, um, uh, that end of things. There is trademark and trademark is a, a law which governs designations of origin of goods and services. And in other words, it's, it helps people keep track of where their goods and services that they're consuming and buying are coming from. So uh, Coca-Cola, one of the most famous trademarks, if you buy a Coca-Cola, it is coming from some distribution channel under the control of the Coca-Cola company, and they will be policing the content of that, of that bottle. And so uh, you, you know what you're getting when you get a Coca-Cola. Uh, patent. Patent covers uh, uh, inventions, essentially, uh, notions of, of, of things that we, we invent. Copyright is, is about expression and about uh, how you, 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 uh, you express things. Um, uh, patent is about inventions, about uh, th thoughts and ideas. The, the copyright law specifically says, we don't cover inventions. The, the patent law says, we do cover inventions. So inventions are covered there. And then the final one, which is a, a little bit um, a different, is the law of trade secret because copyright trademark and patent give you rights in the piece of information itself whether it's uh, the name of a trademark whether it's the the writing or authorship for copyright whether it's uh, the uh, invention for patent essentially the owner of the the rights in that get a right to control those things uh, trade secret doesn't give you a right in the information itself but rather gives you a right to protect that information and keep it secret if you're doing that and we'll see the rules under that. So it's really a set of, of, of laws that say you can't be uh, prevent uh, certain kinds of spying, certain kinds of betrayal of trust, that kind of thing to keep secret secret. But once something's out in the world legitimately through through disclosure or through um, reverse engineering and, and, and uh, independent discovery, there's no protection once it's legitimately out there. OK, so those are our big four. And another concept, which is, I think, very important to keep in mind is the notion of using intellectual property both for offense and defense. By offense, I mean how it adds value to your business. What is it doing to add value to your business? Can you protect um, uh, certain kinds of writings or certain kinds of images or certain inventions in a way that, that means I've got my business can use this. So now I can use it directly in business or my business could just be licensing it to others. Uh, a book author frequently licenses the book to the publishing company and they actually take care of most of the commercial side. But uh, effectively by having that right of offense, you can say, I get to control this. The other piece is what I call defense, and that's avoiding the problems of infringement. You don't want people to infringe to, to, on your uh, intellectual property. You want to avoid infringing on other people's intellectual property. What, what are the limits there? What kind of permissions do I need? When can I use something without permission? Um, that end of things as we go forward. Okay, um, I, so another piece of this offense and defense notion is that if, if I'm selling a, a, a product that involves intellectual property, I sometimes think it's useful to think about the basket that we need. So that if I'm selling a, 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 um, a video, if I'm selling or licensing through the internet or however I'm, I'm using a video, I have to have the rights to all aspects of that video. If the video is based on an underlying book or work, I have to have a license from the owner of that copyright so that my copyright will, will be so that I can turn around and resell it appropriately with rights in it. If I've got actors, I need permissions from them. If I've got um, a director, I need an assignment of, of that director's copyright, uh, that kind of thing. So again, this notion being that it's not just our own discoveries and works that we sometimes need to have in order to have the, the, that offensive ability to do it, but also we need to have the right um, uh, rights, we need to collect rights with third parties that are ingredients in whatever it is that we're, we're offering and selling. So again, think of that as this kind of basket. And the third idea on offense and defense is what is possible uh, uh, both for you to seek and that people could seek against you if there is an infringement. 
And that is uh, typically, if you if people go to court over um, uh, uh, intellectual property and win, they can get an injunction. An injunction says stop, so that if there's an infringing um, 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 a film or a video, that can be taken down from the from the, the web or wherever distribution is. That just stop. You can't distribute it anymore. You can't sell it anymore. Got it. You need to stop. And secondly, the second big one is damages, which is, says if, if, if the folks made money because they, they, they stole your intellectual property, then, then you get to ask for that money uh, through the court. I, and if you made some money, the other folks may ask you to give it back up. If, if I've had losses, and not just about the other side made money, but they caused me to lose money, I can also seek damages on that. So again, the, 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 in this offense and defense piece, remember that in the background of all of this is the legal enforceability, and that legal enforceability will typically be in the form of injunction or damages. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. Uh, are we going to break for, for any, any questions that might come in, uh, or are we just going to, uh, who, who will be managing that? Um, I think uh, we can take a break. I'll, I'll keep an eye on the chat and just see if there's any that pop in there. But um, since we have a small group today, feel free to pop in and ask a question too. But uh, in the chat, help works as well as popping in. And I want to make sure that when we make our transitions that there's time for a question if, if any of the folks have. So sure. are there any questions so far? Thank We're set? You. Okay, cool. Then moving forward, our first topic is going to be copyright. And uh, as I mentioned, copyright is a um, um, uh, covers essentially works of authorship fixed in a tangible medium of expression. That's what the statute says. That's what its coverage is. And by the way, if you want resources, there's some good resources at the U.S. Copyright Office, uh, um, uh, uh, copyright.gov. Um, and that's, that can be a, a good starting point for following up on questions. There's also a, a number of private um, uh, uh, resources as well. Uh, so coverage is works of authorship fixed in a tangible medium of expression. This can include fictional and factual prose. It does not have to be uh, made up to be covered by copyright, but it has to have expression, which is original, um, uh, i.e. The, the author or authors have, have, have a new way of saying something. It can include, it include photos and video. It can include art. Uh, includes music, uh, it even includes some computer programming. There is some protection for computer programming, particularly the particular way a computer program has been expressed. Uh, the functionalities and, and underlying logic are, are not susceptible to copyright. But if there's a way that if there are choices we make about how we express that in different kinds of code in Java or, 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 or uh, some other, other coding language, we can, we can um, protect to some degree those choices. So that's the coverage space. It is there is automatic coverage for authors. Um, the copyright law in the U.S. is is now one that has does not require government intervention or filing or all that kind of thing to have some rights at any rate. Any author, which is an individual or the company, if it's under a work for hire, um, and I'll come back to that in just a moment, they can own. Uh, um, uh, uh, they own the copyright in uh, work on its creation just because they created it. Now, uh, the, the proof of that is, has to be, be maintained. Uh, I, if I'm claiming copyright, have the proof that I am the author. Uh, but it also, um, um, uh, but, but I don't need to do the following. That said, there are two things you can do which are useful, formalities which are useful, um, um, because they, they can help you perfect or add to your rights. Uh, one is the notice provision, the copyright um, a symbol uh, or the word copyright. Uh, and the name of the author or authors, uh, if it's an individual, that person's name, if it's a, um, a company, that company's name, and the date, the year in which the copyright is being claimed by for creation or publication, um, uh, some, some re rationale, typically the, the initial publication being the, 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 the trigger for that date. That notice is useful because it puts people on notice that copyright is being claimed, that it's not just in the public domain. And uh, even though there's protection, even without the copyright notice, just because you, uh, you're a creator, this can make additional uh, damages uh, uh, willful. It can, it can make the behavior of the, the uh, copier willful and, and, and wrongful in ways that it may add some damages to the willful. This, yes, um, Simon. Hi, Professor. Um, I didn't want to cut you off. I can I can hold my question if you want to continue. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So uh, just just to clarify, um, when you say authors, do you, for those who are very literal, uh, is that 
uh, that can be a writer, but does that also extend to anybody in the kind of the, the creative world that could be a photographer or? An yes, yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. The term author is not, although it, we think of it in terms of, of, of a, a writer, typically. The author is the composer of music, the, 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 the person with the camera and photography, the, the, um, uh, in, in something complex like a, a film, it might have a number of authors, the director, the cinematographer, the scriptwriter, all might be partial authors of the film of the completed work itself. So a composite uh, uh, work can, can, can have that kind of, of, of multiple authorship as well. And, and a book a book or a, a song could have, you know, you have the, the classic um, a songwriter of, of a lyricist and a, and a, uh, and a, a composer, a musician, uh, the, the, both of those are authors of the combined work of the song. Okay, okay, thank you. Oh, no, thank um, you for that clarification. Sure. Uh, and uh, just to go back to something you said on on point number two, I, I'm not sure if I'll rephrase it as well as as you put it, but um, uh, you, you said something to the effect of that somebody could change somebody's work to to make it their own. And ah, that well, here, no, here, here's now here's a, 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 a useful point which we should talk about, which is the idea of a derivative work. Mm -hmm. Because a derivative work is a work that builds on an existing work. Uh, it can be uh, uh, one that is, is is done under the control of the original author, uh, actually, because the author, the original author, controls that right. In fact, the derivative work right. So, if if there's a well-known book, that book is made into a movie. That movie is a derivative work. The author of that work of that movie may be um, uh, include the cinematographer and the musician and the and the you know the, the, the scriptwriter etc. But it is a, a work that is now derived from the earlier work. If it is done with appropriate consent, then it is also copyrightable, and and the author of that would be maybe the new folks. Uh, a translation is a derivative work. A, a um, if I adapt a, a, a famous painting for a, a postcard, the postcard is a derivative work of the original. Um, you know, uh, all of that 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 plays out that way. Does that give enough um, um, background? Yeah, yeah, that that's very helpful. Um, you know, I I work with a variety of different kinds of businesses, including artists, and I've worked with uh, folks that are painters, of course, and photographers, and they're always concerned that somebody's going to take their work so it makes them hesitant to put it out in the world uh and so in terms of protecting works like that and if you're going to get to this later on this that's totally fine but just to put it out there um you know if, if somebody were to it's one thing if somebody just takes the work as it is in its original state that's quite obvious without permission but if somebody takes the work and alters it in some way um does that fall under what you're saying? And yes, the and, and the, the preparation of derivative works is one of the rights of the underlying author. And 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 even if it's changed, uh, if it's changed sufficiently, uh, that may not be then considered a derivative work. I can be inspired by something and then go off and do something really quite different. Uh, but uh, and also there's what the concept called fair use we're going to get to in, in a certain point where where you're you know some uses are just allowed um, 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 uh, and we'll we'll get to those in a moment. But the the core piece is that that, that these these adaptations may well be a, a derivative work and if that's the case the preparation of a derivative work is a right in the original offer. Okay. To, 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 and that original author. Now, as a practical matter, when you put something up on the web, yeah, you know, it, I, I, it, it, it becomes hard to control. Uh, right. uh, I mean, there are techniques for putting the proof across it and things like that that, that make it harder to, to, to do from a, just a pure sort of technological standpoint. But that 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 is is um, uh, a, a a practical problem in a sense, not the not the underlying legal. The underlying legal says that the derivative works are, are controlled by the author. Um, making policing that is hard. Um, I should mention fan fiction, by the way, is out there. Um, um, famous works often, you know, people uh, just sit in their in their in their uh, in their study and you know uh, create a, a new a new novel based on the old all, all, you know, the famous one. Uh, that's tricky because that is a derivative work clearly, and 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 something that that should have the permission of the original author if it's going to be published in any ways. But original authors sometimes go, hey, you know, I, I'm not going to sue my fans. You know, what am I going to do? Uh, provided it doesn't it doesn't become a a, a money maker itself in a way that competes with with my underlying works uh, or 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 or, or the, the sequels that I want to do. Um, uh, uh, a famous example of this was the book that eventually became, what is it, Fifty Shades of Grey, which started out as a piece of fan fiction around another 
famous set of, of, of books and TV shows, et cetera, and was then, when it became popular, was actually rewritten by its real author to remove those derivative references and make it into a, a separable thing. Hmm. Interesting. Um, and so just uh, on the opposite end, if somebody wants to use a work, the protocol should be that they need to reach out to the creator to, to request. Yes, that's that, that defensive piece that I was talking about in the basket. They, you, I want to use it. I got to get into the basket. Now, there may be a, 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 a reason under fair use or some other reason that would say I don't have to have permission. There are some uses you don't have to have permission for, but many you do. And reaching out is how you do it. And you say, well, yeah, I can't find them. Well, you know, that's uh, uh, there we go. I, 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 you know, I, I, just because you, I know, I, I'm going to build a, I'm going to build a, a cabin on this land. Well, I better talk to the owner of the land before I build that cabin. I don't know who that owner is. Maybe I'll just build the cabin. Well, okay, but you know, it's it, uh, 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 when the owner shows up and says, "What are you doing with your cabin on my land?" There we go. What are you doing with the, your derivative work on my on my original property? What are we going to do about that? So mm. again, it's, it's 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 worth it's worth figuring out or just making choices to do something else. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I know musicians who who have pieces of poetry they've fallen in love with and they just love to set in music. If it's still under copyright, the answer is, yeah, you know, sorry. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and uh, so assuming um, somebody reached out to the creator for permission, the creator could then decide to either just uh, let them use it, but but get clarification, I'm assuming, on how they plan to use it. And then at that point, they could decide to charge a licensing fee. Is that where yeah, licensing fee comes exactly. in? This is a matter of, 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 of free bargaining between the people. Okay, and uh, and that can be they can say use it for free, um, use it and pay me, use it with this limitation, only use it for distribution in in, in Vermont. You know, uh, there's a number of different things one can do. Okay, thank you. Uh, and last question, and this goes to point number four: formality is useful. Um, so, did I understand you cor correctly that um, the 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 creator doesn't have to register it through copyright, although they can. Is that Yes, is that exactly. True? In fact, I'm going to pick, when we're done with questions, I'm going to pick back up on registration. Oh, perfect. The two, the two pieces are the notice, useful, do it. It, 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 it increases the notice to the uh, to an uh, uh, to a um, an infringer and 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 may increase the amount of damages that are possible. The underlying copyright back before the 1976 Act changes, you could lose your copyright if you didn't put a notice in. Not the law now, but you may lose certain additional rights if you don't have a uh, notice. Uh, and then for the same is true with registration. Registration is when you. Uh, 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 take your work and you you deposit a copy together with the appropriate forms with the with the Library of Congress. Um, uh, basically, registration is run by the Library of Congress. Why? Because the Library of Congress was originally essentially uh, established for free by saying anybody who wants copyright needs to send us two copies. So the Library of Congress basically got got two copies of any 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 uh, seriously published book in, or other work in in the in, in the U.S. So the Library of Congress's collection is partly built through these copyright submissions. But um, um, that said, uh, 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 the Library of Congress is, it does that. You, you, there, there's a set of forms for that. I, I, I say do it yourself is possible here. Uh, you can go to the website at the Library of Congress under copyright.gov, copyright.gov. It will do you, you can walk through the steps. Basically, uh, a, a, a copy or copies of the work are, are sent to the registration um, uh, office there at the Copyright Office and then um, uh, uh, with with the appropriate attributions, et cetera, and a bit of a fee, and then then it's registered and it'll be in the record. Um, registration is often a prerequisite to suing, so so it's useful in that context. It also puts again pe puts people on notice, gets gets it out there, the fact that you were the author back at this time. Uh, there are reasons to try and do this. Um, multiple works, and one of the fine arts arts and photographers have some problem because they the, the, the copyright office wants you to uh, upload um, uh, individual works individually and not as a group. But sometimes there's a, there's a possibility of, of putting together a book, an album of, and then then registering the album, and that would, would cover the contents of the album to some degree in any way. So there we go. What's what's the core deal of, of, of copyright is that the rights last for either the life of, of the author, or if there's multiple authors, the last author to die. So it's always co-author with, with, a, with a 20 year old, uh, and, um, or 90, 95 years. If I co-author with a 20-year-old who then lives to, to, to 90, uh, that, that uh, 70 years plus then the 70 years after the death could be 140 years. Copyright can last a long time. Next slide, please. 
So uh, what are the rights of, uh, go ahead. Yes. So, sorry, sorry, Professor. Uh, back to the last slide for us for a moment with the, um, with the last point um, that the, the, the term, the time in the life of n up to 95 years. Uh, 95, by the way, is for, is for, is for a work for hire copyright. If the corporation gets a copyright, then it's, then it's will be 95 years because the corporation may or may not go out of business. It could be, you know, endless. So, and so the by by difference the seventy year one that would be for the creator themselves. That that'd be if the if the author is the original if the author is a human being. Yes. Okay. And so on that point, can can a creator pass along um, the rights to their work to the, the, their, their right is their the, the the copyright is is inheritable property. So that basically they can sell it to a company and then then the company would have it, uh, or they could also. Uh, 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 pass it on to, to their heirs. They could give it to the Vermont Law School and grad, Law and Graduate School. Well, uh, we, 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 yeah. uh, yeah. Or they could, they could uh, 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 give it to to their 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 children, grandchildren, their brothers, sisters, nieces, nephews, whatever whatever the, the heirs are for the property. Do do they need to do that in a formal way, or does that automatically transfer? Doesn't automatically transfer. It, it is it is a piece of the estate. Um, uh, if if people die without a will, they die intestate, and then the, there's a a, a the laws of intestacy take over uh, and and distribute the property. So it's automatic in that sense. But but there's nothing in the copyright law that basically passes it along. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you so much. And I should mention, by the way, when we're talking about authors, uh, when we're talking about uh, authors here, that, uh, that we're still working on the question of what degree is AI an author? And if the AI is used by someone to create something, is that somebody who did the creation an author? If somebody designs an AI system, are they the author? This is up in the air. At the moment, the Copyright Office's position is that, that if something is, is, is essentially a product of an AI prompt, uh, that, that, that that is not human authorship and not copyright. Uh, that's their current position, as I understand it. Uh, that may change. We'll see. But but again, AI and, and AI assisted stuff. Woo wee! Now we're 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 into new territory, and it's uh, it's not fully clear. All right. Uh, next slide. What are the rights of the copyright holder? I, I re uh, referred to this already a little bit. Section one hundred and six uh, discusses uh, copies um, and um, uh, uh, the making of copies. Uh, and their sale and distribution, including web distribution, public performance and display. This includes web broadcast, includes broadcast, web distribution, et cetera, public performance. And I have public in italics because it isn't nonprofit versus profit, it is public versus private. So a nonprofit which displays thing in a public way is potentially uh, uh, violating this, this right. The right to prepare derivative works, we talked about a bit, bit about that already. That's the endless list in 106. And there are some special rules on music radio and streaming. Uh, mu there, there, there's a history here I won't go into, but uh, music radio uh, uh, um, um, a broadcast has, has only partial uh, copyright coverage. Uh, um, uh, uh, streaming, computerized streaming, tends to have full copyright coverage, which includes both the, the, uh, the um, uh, recordings and the, uh, the underlying authors of the music. Offense, offense, and some use cases. Make sure you get your rights from employees, contractors, etc. If you're creating a work that has more than one contributor and you are managing that process, you are the, the, the centralized uh, uh, producer of the film or or uh, the uh, the publisher of whatever. Make sure that all of the of the contributors, from the employees, contractors, etc., have a, have have assigned that work to the um, uh, uh, the, the central node is going to kind of be the basket for distribution. So again, it's that basket. I get get the get the basket, get the rights in, uh, get that collected. That's a, a key element in being able then to resell a, a, that kind of collaborative work. On defense, on defense. Uh, here, as we talked already a little bit about this, you know, get that clearance. Clearance is when is the term we sometimes use for getting a a this, the necessary rights from another copyright holder. If you're going to use copyrighted music uh, to accompany the video, get that cleared. Find out who controls those rights. Maybe the original musician, maybe a publishing company, maybe whatever. Find that out and get that license. Um, uh, it is not an excuse to say I tried and I didn't find them because I didn't know who they were and I my, no, no it just that 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 isn't an excuse if you're using copyright. 
And then there's a really broad idea of fair use, which really is, is, is a notion that, that, that in addition to the to, to licensed uses, some there are some uses in society that just are not going to be, um, uh, they're just going to be allowed because, because they are. And I believe, uh, 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 Callum, that you have picked up on the fair use topic. Would you take it from here? Sure. Yeah, totally. Thank you. And I might, my little teleprompter here, which is just my notepad. So if you see me looking, that's why. Um, so fair use is a defense uh, available to defendants in a copyright lawsuit. Um, it provides exceptions uh, for the use of copyrighted material for educational use, critique, uh, comment, news reporting, scholarship, or research. Uh, fair use is not an absolute permission to use copyrighted material. Uh, it is a defense in, uh, after a lawsuit has already been filed, which means a judge will determine whether the use was fair or not, or falls within the statutory requirements. Uh, however, people do plan their actions knowing that fair use exists. A good example of this uh, is a filmmaker talking with a lawyer about their plans to make a documentary about logos. So making sure that um, that might be considered fair use and they'll take that risk and, and make that movie. Um, it's a documentary, so it's educational, right? Uh, a bad example uh, comes from a TV show uh, <laughs> called Nathan For You, uh, where a satirist called uh, Nathan Fielder gives bad business advice. And in one episode, he's working with a client uh, who is who runs a cafe and is having trouble competing against Starbucks. So after uh, after Nathan misinterprets his lawyer's advice about fair use for satire, he recommends creating a cafe called Dumb Starbucks. And uh, so he runs it. It's you can you can look it up on YouTube. It's it's on it was in the news uh, and he was really lucky. He didn't get sued, but uh, but it was a big risk for on his part. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that covers both of the copyright aspects of, of, of the use of, of Starbucks and some of their logos and things, and it would also cover the, the trademark piece, which we're going to talk about in a bit. So, so uh, the fair use can be in either of those contexts. Another example of, of fair use that I sometimes uh, use in class is it says educational use. Uh, that's not endless. I can't just photocopy the textbook and give it to everybody. But I am allowed to sort of call up online uh, um, uh, uh, today's article from the New York Times and discuss it in class. And that would be a classic example of fair use. Another classic example is, is, is satire and comedy, where we, we make fun of something. And if you're going to make fun of it, you have to actually use it. Another example would be criticism. I, I can quote uh, lines from, from a, a, a paragraph from a book and say, this is beautifully written, or say, this is terribly written. Uh, uh, again, that kind of piece. The core, the core element really in fair use is whether what we're doing is a different kind of use or is it substituting? I can't say I'm going to do a critique of the Star Wars movies and in order to do a critique I have to show you the whole first movie. Here, there you go, pay, pay my website, see the whole first thing and then I'll, I'll talk about it. Can't do that because now we're substituting the whole work. I could take five minute excerpts, I can do that kind of thing, but, the, but I can't substitute for the whole. Simon, you have a question. Yes, thank you. Um couple of questions. First one on the offense, uh, second point there. Um, is there a specific kind of form that, uh, that someone would get for this? And what would it be called if they wanted to um, make sure that they had their rights from employees or, or contractors? Ah, uh, there, are, uh, there, there are, are standard agreements which uh, uh, transfer rights. Uh, uh, again, I, 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 I'm not um, going to going to endorse necessarily any of them, but um, yeah. actually, I have a book called uh, "This Business of Television," which went through three editions and has forms in the back. I can I can endorse that one anyway. Uh, <laughs> about about how, you know the language of assignment. The web has a lot of things on it. This is when it can be useful to talk to an attorney as well. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that actually you'll hear about in our program at, at Vermont Law and Graduate School is that we have, uh, at least in uh, certain circumstances, the ability to make references, referrals of folks to um, uh, Vermont Bar Association uh, uh, provided att uh, attorneys who will, and we can we can help subsidize the cost of that up to between five and 10 hours sometimes. Uh, so there are, are ways of doing it. This is worth talking to an attorney about, making sure you get the form correct. But there's a bunch of them on the web. Um, 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 a rights transfer agreement, uh, you know, a, a, a copyright license agreement. There's a bunch of okay. different di different search terms that one could use to do okay. that. Um, yeah, uh, I there are also services like like uh, Rocket Lawyer and things. I have 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 versions of some of these which they'll they'll sell to you. Um, again, I don't recommend any particular one, but they they are often you know reasonably well put together and, and can do can be serviceable. 
Thank you. I guess that, you know, that kind of gets to what the essence of my question was, was like, d does, does those forms have a particular name, like non-disclosure agreement? You know, when you say non-disclosure agreement, people know what to look for. Right. So with this kind of um, Co copyright license, copyright transfer, you know, that okay. would be some of the things that you might look for. Okay, great. Thank you. Copyright um, assignment, sometimes it's called an assignment in this context. as well. Great. Thank you. Um, and last question for the fair use. Um, so with fair use, uh, I think you were talking about how maybe an organization might might use something. Would I'm even if it's for education, I'm assuming that, and correct me if I'm wrong, but would the protocol still be that they should reach out to the creator for permission? Oh, good, 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 good question. The answer is uh, uh, if you are convinced that something is fair use, um, you know, I mean, it's always good to get get somebody to, else to agree to it. They may not. I mean, this is a judgment you make for yourself. As Callum mentioned, this is the ultimate judge in this is a judge. Uh, the intermediate judge on this is the is is maybe a lawyer that gets talked to. Uh, uh, the, the 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 first layer is the the user. Um, you know, I, I do not when I if I'm going to pull the New York Times article up in my class to talk about it in a topical way, I'm not getting in touch with the New York Times because I feel comfortable enough that that's the case. Sure. If I'm going to make a a, 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 a a movie that critiques the New York Times, et cetera, I may want to talk to a lawyer who's expert in this. In fact, I am an expert in this. People have over the years hired me to do exactly this, to look at a movie and say, is this an okay use? I can't guarantee because it is ultimately the, the judgment of the, of the judge in the end, but I've got a pretty good notion of what, what, what the cases say and what, what, what this is going to be. And this, is this a permissible uh, uh, critique or is it a, a is it a, a, an impermissible one? Um, you know, where 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 does that come out? Uh, so so and then the final the final determination on it would be a judge, and hopefully we don't get that far out. But but uh, um, uh, the judges um, uh, do this. People, um, copyright owners often are 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 dismissive of fair use because they don't want it. Uh, 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 content uh, uh, critiquers are often a little over generous, maybe in their but but it's it shouldn't be disregarded. There's a whole set of websites, by the way, on on this. Uh, um, Harvard's Berkman Klein Center has a, 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 a set of videos on fair use and things that and there are there folks who want to understand this better. There are tools out there for, for educating themselves further on. Uh, but it is, again, in the end, the, the individual judgment, uh, legal advice, and then hopefully not uh, the, the judge's determination. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, yes, trademark. Uh, Trademark resources. Trademark. And trademark is this different thing. Trademark is 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 dealing with um, uh, with these uh, uh, designations of origin of goods and services. Uh, there, uh, the, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, USPTO.gov, has has good resources again. Uh, um, uh, but there's also state law involved in this. It's both federal and state law. And the purpose is to uh, let people know what they're getting when they buy something, when they when they buy uh, uh, some goods or services. Uh, if I decided to make a a, 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 a sweet tasting carbonated fizzy drink, um, 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 calling it Professor Goodenough Cola isn't gonna, gonna, gonna get it much marketing, but if I, hey, if I call it Coca-Cola, then you know, people would be confused and they'd buy it and that, that'd be cool for me. It wouldn't be great for Coca-Cola company and it wouldn't be great for the consumers who want to get, get something that isn't made in the back room by Professor Goodenough. Uh, so um, uh, uh, the, the, what we what the law basically says is that 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 we cannot pass off goods or services from one party as if it was from another. It's this whole notion of kind of passing off and avoiding um, um, uh, likelihood of confusion. Um, so there's an underlying stratus of the law which is, allows for unregistered un, um, un, uh, marks to have some some protection. You know, again, basically, if if um, if, if uh, somebody else, if I'm selling Professor Goodenough Cola and I haven't registered anything or whatever, but I'm just selling it, uh, somebody else who, who creates Professor Goodenough Cola, I would have just the right to 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 sue even not registered if it were if there was a likelihood of confusion and, and an attempt to pass off their goods as mine. Um, but uh, registration helps because registration um, uh, prevents, um, uh, uh, give, gives, a, a fe sorry, both federal and state registries. Registration gives a, 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 a um, uh, extra, extra rights. It gives nationwide protection. It, if it's federal, it gives access to federal courts, which is useful. There's a whole set of good reasons why registering. Also, now as people are on notice around the country, um, uh, there we are. 
the the, um, the 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 designation that we see of folks who have registered is the little R in the circle or the S in the circle for service mark. Uh, the um, uh, unfair competition, if we're just relying on unregistered things, people often put TM after it. That designates that folks, hey, be aware, we're, we're claiming this. It's not registered, but we're claiming it. What is registrable and what is protectable? Let me go back up to levels of protectability because um, um, a certain kinds of, 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 of marks are just uh, not recognized as giving much protection at all and are certainly un unregisterable. And the base level of that is generic, where there's no cop there's no trademark protection, rather. Uh, uh, why is this the case? Because I cannot trademark or make any claim about confusion if I use the word cheese to describe a um, a, 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 an aged uh, solidified cow milk or goat milk uh, 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 product. Okay, that's what it, that's what it's known as. So it's known as cheese. Um, I we can also um, uh, have a um, um, uh, something called a descriptive, and maybe there's descriptive. Descriptive isn't the thing itself, but is a descriptive item. There's a famous case around a, a company called Zatarans, I believe it is, which makes spices in the in the Louisiana area. And Zatarans had a product called Fish Fry, and as we hear, see, Fish Fry is kind of descriptive. I mean, it's not just the the the, the name of that spice; it's not just spices, but it's fish fry, uh, uh, and normally that would not be protected, but it can be if it gets secondary meaning. And apparently this product was so popular in that part of the country in any rate, that in that area, if you said, hey, I'm getting uh, getting some of that fish fry spice, uh, people knew exactly what you're talking about, and it was a Zatarans product. So uh, descriptive can grow if it gets this secondary meaning. Uh, and we can put descriptive marks into a secondary register and when registration, and they sort of wait there and, and see if they get that uh, that that the secondary meaning develops. Third level is sort of suggestive. It's not really des descriptive, but it's it's suggestive. And now we're we're into something uh, that that is maybe um, uh, it's a little bit you know, not 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 a, a, a an easy description. Um, there's a cheese product called Hull of a Good Cheese um, um, that may fall into this descriptive bucket. Where and they spell it funny, so so it's uh, anyway. Um, um, uh, 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 it's not just descriptive, as, uh, but maybe suggestive. That can be uh, 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 registered often. Arbitrary, arbitrary is good. Arbitrary is something like like um, um, uh, you calling um, uh, a computer an apple. Apple is a word. Apple is an offensive word, but apple is 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 a is a term that you would not normally use for for electronics. So it is it is arbitrary in that context. Apple, by the way, would be generic in the food context, but it is arbitrary in the computer context. And then fanciful, which is the best, which is made up words. Um, uh, uh, the, the oil company Exxon with two X's, made up word. Uh, 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 drug manufacturers often have these, these 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 wonderful words for their drugs, which have a lot of Q's and X's and things. Uh, squirt flex, you know, uh, use my squirt flex to to keep your eyesight and um, you know, fresh and clear. Um, um, again, that that because they're so fanciful, they, they they're just unlikely to have been used by anybody else. And there we go. Now, um, uh, 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 what we're going to talk about a little bit is how you find that. Um, 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 how you find that, uh, because it is a um, um, uh, how, how you find it is is, is important. Um, uh, one of the things to do is say, I want to have a new mark. The first rule is don't fall in love with it, because it is not um, um, uh, uh, it is not um, uh, uh, the, the, the the there is almost nothing that, unless it's really fanciful, a lot of Q's and X's in it, that hasn't been used in some other context. Uh, you, you, you think you come up with some really cool word to describe your good or service, and it's gonna be really cool, and somebody else is using it. Now, that's not necessarily the end of the story because uh, use in a different line of commerce may not be a problem, but, um, uh, but nonetheless, it is something to, to, to keep track of and be, be, be aware of and understand that you can't, you gotta go in with 10 different um, uh, possibilities when you begin this search rather than just one that you fall in love with. Uh, Devin, will you want to take us through a little bit of how you can use the, the trademarks office's search capacity to uh, to, to help you f f find is there already a registration of that name and what, what, what lines of commerce that is involved in? Yeah, thank you. Uh, USPTO.gov has a link to a, a trademark electronic search system, uh, also called TESS, T-E-S-S. -S. 
This search engine or search system allows a person to search for registered trademarks to avoid uh, likelihood of confusion. And so if someone is looking to possibly trademark uh, a phrase or even a design mark, a word mark, design mark, then uh, this search system, TESS, allows you to see what others have registered. That's that's great. Thank you. Um, uh, 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 um, and, and the mark, uh, uh, the, the um, uh, access to this searching system is available through uh, 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 trademark uh, PT, USPTO.gov. It's it's quite straightforward to use. Uh, the, the, that part of the website is a pretty good uh, functionality. Just be aware that when it turns up that, that that somebody is using your word, that's not necessarily the end of the story. Uh, the word or our, uh, because it, again, different aspects of commerce may be allowed to use different pieces. Simon, you have a, a question. Yes, thank you. Um, two questions. Um, one, just to clarify with trademarks that that can, a trademark can be applied to uh, a word or a combination of words. Can it also be applied to like uh, a logo? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, logos, looks, trade dress, um, uh, logos, et cetera. All those are all potentially identifying um, uh, characteristics. Well, any characteristic that becomes associated and, and becomes identifiable with that product, a good and service can be done. For instance, uh, 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 Coca-Cola has trademarked its classic, you know, um, uh, mm. uh, sort, sort of uh, um, uh, wasp waste uh, bottle. Narrow mm -hmm. waste bottle where it's got, mm -hmm. um, um, and that uh, other soft drink companies can't use that because uh, that's that's a, a a a piece of trade dress as they call it, which is now mm -hmm. associated with Coca Cola. Okay, um, would a slogan could a slogan also be? Uh, uh, yes, a slogan can be. Uh, uh, the the, the Chick Fil A folks have 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 uh, have uh, 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 claimed trademark in eat more chicken. You know, which they spell in funny ways, uh, 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 and and is is it wouldn't necessarily be a, a, a be trademarkable in the context of, of a chicken offering, but but um, uh, 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 sorry, uh, uh, but uh, 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 actually, sorry, they are the chicken offering, but uh, but it's with cows, it's with that whole funny thing. There we go. They claim they claim that famously, by the way, they 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 tried uh, they they had a dispute with a, a Vermont um, a t-shirt maker over who had eat more kale on on the mm -hmm. t-shirt. And uh, um, um, uh, Chick Fil A claimed uh, um, uh, uh, that, that was a potentially an infringement um, because of the um, um, uh, the eat more piece. Um, 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 it never got a legal determination because the, the Chick Fil A folks were basically laughed out of it eventually, um, uh, trying to say that kale and kale and chicken were going to be a problem. With each other. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, my other question is uh, when you do uh, a search at the USPTO. Uh, do you have to put in the exact spelling and words you're looking for? I mean, um, a lot of things have like the in front of them, for example. Right. No, no, it, it will it will produce. <laughs> you do want to be, get your spellings exact because it has a kind of a matching tool, but mm -hmm. it will match things that are within a, a trademark uh, as well. So if, if I had uh, uh, Professor Goodenough's cola, mm -hmm. if you put in the term good enough, it would find me. And that. If you put in the term cola, it will find that plus you know twenty seven thousand other things. But 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 it will find it will find examples of that term and then then use it again. Um, if you want to use it, the instructions for use are, are there with the website. But it is it is it is a reasonably decent search tool. Let me put it that way. Okay. Okay. Uh, 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 Devin, you you want to chime in? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you can use uh, search functions like quotation marks to search specific phrases. And you can also use uh, operators like and or or. And these allow you to, you know, a little bit more flexibility in your search. Thank you. Uh, so classic kind of kind of Boolean search kind of approach, word-based okay. search. And now, if you're in a completely different industry from, from something, does does that matter? If you're in yes, a different industry- it, it potentially matters, it matters a great deal. Uh, uh, classic trademarking was done typically by lines of commerce. Uh, uh, so, in other words, if if um, uh, if if I had uh, Professor Goodenough's cola, uh, and somebody wanted to do Professor Goodenough's car rental, um, uh, you know, that would probably not be 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 um, uh, um, uh, 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 deemed to be a, a, create a likelihood of confusion because they're separate enough product lines that. that uh, 
Now, there are very famous marks which have an added layer of protection called anti-dilution. And so big famous marks, they, they get to say, hey, even if it's a different line of commerce, uh, people are just going to think it is. So again, our old friends at Coca-Cola, if, if I started the Coca-Cola car rental company, it's a different line of commerce. But Coca-Cola is so famous that, that and anybody who's have seen the word Coca-Cola in front is going to presume it's being run out of a, out of a company based in Atlanta. Uh, Georgia, you know, uh, and and so that, that would be the, the case. But again, that's for, for marks with sufficient fame that, that people just would presume. So that's called anti-dilution, which sits on top of the normal copyright. So yes, line of commerce typically matters, but there are cases where, where it doesn't. Okay. Um, and this question might seem like it's at a left field a little bit, but, um, you know, in the, in the craft beer market, there's been such a competition for names and so many names have already been used and so in some regional places right uh, they might use a name for a beer uh, uh, and it doesn't really extend beyond that area and you know lo and behold the same name is being used in one way shape or form somewhere else can um, if that happens uh should the businesses connect to to talk about it? Can one business say, "Well, you know, you're not in my region. Go ahead and use it. I don't care. We don't have no. We don't have a plans to be in your area." Well, it's uh, sometimes you can work out lines of commerce agreements between people to avoid a, a, a dispute. T to be a little technical about it, um, um, uh, on an unregistered basis, geography matters because if my sales territory doesn't overlap with your sales territory, there's no likelihood of confusion because nobody knows that 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 that, 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 that Vermont um, uh, um, uh, pumpkin lager is 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 um, uh, 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 isn't the same thing as the as the Oregon State pumpkin lager. Mm -hmm. um, uh, um, uh, but uh, and pumpkin lager might be descriptive. I shouldn't think of, of, of a better name um, for that. Something more arbitrary. Um, 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 software lager. Okay, let's go. Let's call it software lager. Um, um, uh, the um, um, but one one uh, but if if one of them registers, they will get potentially national treatment. And now now that covers even without the geography. Otherwise, it's sort of when you start to bump up against each other in Missouri selling your 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 your, your software logger, now we got you know we got to figure that one out. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I if I try and register I better have been the first user of software uh, longer because the, the registration gives priority to the first user. The, the other one can come in and say, no, no, we were the first user. We object and, and you can't use it. Or, or um, uh, well, we could make that arrangement of some kind of uh, the register but divide it up. Uh, or um, um, uh, even if we do register, they're probably going to be grandfathered in for the markets they're currently in. Hmm. Okay. So, okay. so registration is a layer that can help solve this, but it but it has these wrinkles in it as you go forward. Yeah, if you if you discover you're using it and somebody else is using it, not the end of the story, but it gets complicated. Great, thank you. All right. Um, now, um, 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 uh, let me see here. Uh, registered, unregistered. We talked about generic. Okay, next slide. Trademark two. Um, Registration process, um, um, uh, again, first of all, find something distinctive enough to register, do the searches. And in addition to the trademark search, search the web, you know, see what 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 a, what a Google search or, or a Bing or other search turns up. Um, um, uh, uh, search um, uh, the shelves, search, you know, just uh, see what we can find out there. Is there somebody doing this? Uh, uh, and um, um, registration is something that the people can, can handle themselves, DIY, maybe okay. But it's expert help can be helpful here as well, particularly on things like uh, lines of commerce and other somewhat technical pieces where making the wrong decision in, in that can, can create a, a difficulty going forward. So getting some expert help can be helpful there as well. Um, and remember that the URL and corporate names need clearing as well. And even if the thing is available in trademark, if it turns out that the, the, uh, the, the, the um, uh, that that computer uh, computerlogger.com already exists in somebody's ownership. Ah, that may be a problem. So you want to clear up and down the corporate name, the the the, the web the web page and, and identity, the um, uh, the uh, uh, the trademark uh, registration and not unregistered aspects. So uh, again, clearing in this kind of context requires that kind of investigation. Um, uh, what lines of com? Okay, you, 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 we talked a bit about what do lines of commerce mean. Uh, rights of the holder, um, um, uh, in, injunction, damages, um, and, and as we've seen, 
uh, and border control. They can say, if there's an infringer, say, get, get an injunction, say, stop. Uh, they can get damages back. And they can also sometimes stop stuff at the border. This is an added piece that we can do with trademark or something here. Uh, offense and use cases. Uh, before finding a usable mark, um, harder and uh, harder. Um, as I said, don't fall in love with it. Before finding out uh, USPTO search, Google URL domain names, et cetera. And enforcing it, enforcing it as part of so ownership. Even if you license it to somebody else, uh, you have to actually inspect what they do. And 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 because and if you want to claim and there's somebody infringing, you actually have to go out and stop them because otherwise it might be seen as a, as a, as a, an infringement. Professor Cloran, you are now visible. <laughs> Hello. There was just a question to clarify on what what could you go over lines of commerce again? Because I think oh, that so, it could yeah. probably help to clarify. Sure. Line of commerce is basically if 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 I um, am using um, Apple and my computer, and the, the the Beatles have already used Apple as a as a brand of music. Uh, on my computers, I'm not going to be confused necessarily with music because those are two separate lines of commerce. And when they first got going on that, Apple and the Beatles basically said, yeah, you're, you're doing music, uh, Beatles, uh, 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 Steve Jobs, uh, you're doing you're doing uh, uh, computers. We'll 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 live with that separation because they're different lines of commerce. They're different different areas of, of, of where people buy and sell. Computers are not the same as music. Music's not the same as food. Uh, food's not the same as um, uh, as uh, cleaning services. Uh, cleaning services not the same as automobiles. Again, they're different classes. The USPTO has a set of standard classification, and one of the things you need to do is to decide which one you're in. And again, that's one where some 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 technical legal help may be useful too. Um, by the way, when, when Apple then went and got its music service, Apple Music, they had to go back and revisit that problem with the, with the, the whoever it was at that point who owned Apple from the Beatles. So um, um, that 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 was an interesting overall. Okay, great, glad that happened. All right, so registration um, um, it can be done by oneself, but again, it may be useful to have have um, uh, uh, help rights of the holder injunction. Offensive use case finding a usable mark again, don't fall in love. Um, um, de defense again. There may be some 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 fair use aspects here as well. Devin, do you want to pick that that piece up for for a minute or two? Yeah, I can do that. Um, there are generally uh, two categories of fair use. I don't know if you can see me, but um, descriptive and nominative fair use. Uh, nominative fair use is uh, generally using a mark, uh, some words that are trademarked to identify uh, goods and services. So, for example, if I am referring to uh, Casio printed, printers and uh, I use the mark, the word mark Casio, and I'm describing the printers themselves, that might constitute a fair use. And then there's also a descriptive fair use where I'm using a descriptive mark. Um, for example, honeycomb uh, dehumidifiers have uh, honeycomb shapes in parts of the dehumidifier. And if I use honeycomb shapes to describe uh, part of that dehumidifier, that might also uh, constitute descriptive fair use. And so generally, uh, unauthorized use of a trademark does expose someone to an infringement claim, but uh, these exceptions, um, insofar you're not endorsing the mark or, or using it as kind of a sponsorship, um, you may have opportunity to use it fairly. Exactly. So if we if we have a product review uh, uh, page and we we referred to um, these um, 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 honeycomb dehumidifiers, um, uh, that would even if honeycomb was a registered trademark, we are not claiming that we're um, uh, we are um, uh, our our origin of our of our critique is 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 them. What we're saying instead, we're using that in that descriptive way that he he he, he talked about. Uh, and also we can use it um, uh, if 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 we have one. Sorry, sorry. Um, in the, in that nominative way, rather you talked about, it. and if we use it uh, to describe uh, a, a honeycomb aspect of it of a different dehumidifier or even our own dehumidifier, it may be okay. Again, if it's it, we can't, we're not marking it directly as a honeycomb one, but we're saying it has honeycomb features. Um, uh, that would not be then a use of the mark in that sense of, of designating goods or services. So that those are kinds of exceptions. Uh, by the way, there's a distinction sometimes made between accidental infringement, where we just hey, I didn't realize I was doing it. I'm terribly sorry, and willful or intentional infringement, where the penalties may be higher. So again, there's there's a difference there uh, in, in that. 
All right, next slide. Okay, we're about to move to patent. Uh, any any final trademark questions, uh, Simon? Yeah, uh, maybe this isn't quick. It's a quick question. Maybe the answer is not so quick, but so feel free to cover some other point if you if you prefer. But um, whether it's patents, trademarks, copyright, or the or the next topic, um, when it comes to defending these things from a practical perspective, what is that like for like say a small one person? you know, artist or operation, uh, I think we've all heard that, or many people have heard, it's been stated that it can be very expensive to enforce these things. And so from a practical standpoint on that level, what should people do or expect and what's reasonable? Yeah, uh, I wish, you know, this is this is a, a systemic problem of the U.S. legal service, which is people can have rights, but if they can't afford to enforce them, does it matter? Mm -hmm. um, uh, one of the, the tricks is is to is to come together for enforcement. Um, uh, and on the on the composer songwriter side, there is ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC as 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 organizations which are defending um, uh, um, uh, basically music authors, uh, songs uh, composers, and and, and authors. Uh, they are. Um, they, because they've come together, basically they send inspectors around to bars around the, around the, the, the country and say, "Hey, are, are you are you playing music in an unauthorized way? Uh, if you are, then we as we we will collect a, a license fee from you, but a blanket license, and we will then distribute that to our members. Uh, so that they, they, you know, strength in numbers is one one piece of that. Uh, I'm not aware that there's a, sadly a, an artist or creator's version of that either. That would make things easier. Um, it is can be expensive to defend. I mean, a a a, a reputable uh, company or whatever who's inf infringing will, if you point out to them they're infringing, will say, "Oh, gee, we should stop," or they'll say, "Hey, can we pay you a few bucks and keep going?" Um, uh, less reputable companies may say, uh, 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 "What my kids used to say: I'm, I'm a nan and nan, boo boo, you can't make me." Uh, you know, uh, you know, what do I do then? Well, um, um, you either um, um, uh, figure out it, what it, what is it worth to to, to enforce. Uh, and how can I do that? Typically, sadly, the, most of these intellectual property pieces, although there is a, a criminal aspect, the criminal law doesn't necessarily get enforced very much. So one thing to do would be to try and get, you know, the U.S. Um, uh, state's attorney or the, for, and the U.S. attorney for your, your district to, to bring a lawsuit on your behalf or not on your behalf, but, but the, as a criminal prosecution. That is a possibility, but it's a long shot because it's very, very rarely done. Um, so um, uh, um, uh, you know, concerted action, um, uh, get, get help from the government, um, um, uh, find an attorney. If, if, if the person is really, if the infringer really is making a lot of money on this, you may be able to get an attorney to take it on on a, um, on a, um, a contingency fee basis, which is that basis where they, they, you, know, you share the, the outcome with them. Uh, they, they figure, hey, we can make, you know, we, can get, we can get several hundred thousand from this, these folks, I'll, I'll take it on and we'll, we'll do that. Uh, but you're going to give me 30% or 40, 35% or whatever it is. Um, uh, there are in copyright, there are statutory damages which increase it. So, you know, what's the, somebody uses your copyrighted work and they go, nana, nana, boo, boo. And, you know, you lost $5, you're going to sue me. And the answer is willful. There, there, there's if each, each infringement can be sometimes recovered if it's willful in that way up to more than a hundred thousand bucks. So that, that puts some interesting numbers on the table and makes it, makes it possible. Uh, the, there is not the equivalent in patent or trade. I'm sorry, can you repeat that last part? There is not the equivalent of that statutory damage piece in patent or trademark. Basically. Oh, okay. And uh, obviously all this pertains to the United States, but what if the offending party is in a different country? Oh, even, even more difficult. Uh, uh, because uh, the... the um, um, a, just the practicalities of it are hard. Mm -hmm. um, if you're in the U.S. and you're, you know, some of these things you can get border enforcement where you can stop if they're importing the, the offending good and you can actually just stop them at the border. Uh, the U.S., um, the, 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 um, um, the, the border um, uh, the tariff folks will, will, will custom service will, will sometimes uh, uh, do that, particularly with, with trademark and perhaps a patent. But also, um, uh, but enforcing it outside the U.S. Now we just, you know, again, do you go to China? Do you go to 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 to, to Brazil? Where, you know, do you, do you go and do that? Do you hire a lawyer there? If you're a big company, if you're Coca-Cola, you do. Hmm. If it's just you, uh, hard to know. Um, uh, 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 the rights uh, to do that are even sometimes under question. A patent has to be filed for in every jurisdiction that you want protection, and that's expensive up front. 
a, a, a trademark, there is some trademark assistance on that, but even those have to be filed for typically to get that, get, get it, uh, get it um, 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 fully perfected. Copyright is auto, more auto, automatic and, and our treaty partner countries typically will give you automatic protection on the copyright. Thank you. International is a whole, uh, a whole, a whole another, another thing. And, and as you say, yikes, um, 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 uh, is it worth it for an ind for an individual to try and enforce in Brazil? I don't know. Gotcha. Thank you. I knew it was kind of a loaded question, but I thought it was still relevant to ask. So thank you. No, good, good question. Well, let's move on to Pat because we we were actually are consuming our time here, and and I want to want to make sure we get get through the next couple of questions topics. Pat, patent um, uh, resources. USPTO.gov is both trademarked and patent. There's a whole um, set of resources on patent at the patent office. Coverage and purpose. Inventions, basically inventions and the categories of inventions are that it must be a machine a manufacturer a composition of matter or a method or process so it's basically um uh, the four m's if you if you want a machine um, uh, manufacturer matter or method um, uh, and uh, the machine manufacturer and composition of matter are all material things these are 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 are, are uh, a machine is is you know a, a car a, a a toaster you know something that does something a manufacturer is is something that that, that is just made and is made um, uh, and is, is useful when it's made. Certain kinds of nails are are manufacturers, but not machines. A a a, a, a um, an extra special invention of a, of a new form of of of, of, of screw and uh, would, would could potentially be patented um, uh, as a as a manufacturer. Uh, a composition of matter is, is drugs, it's molecules, it's it's um, um, uh, alloys, it's it's that end of things. So drug patents typically would come in in its composition of matter, um, a, a a new form of of, of uh, 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 plow that that really does a great job of breaking up the earth would be a, a, a machine probably, uh, and a new form of screw or nail would be a manufacturer. Methods or process patents are often uh, how you do stuff. And what you do and how you do it. So, for instance, um, uh, there's there's a a, a a rule out there as we see here that natural laws and natural substances are not patentable. Um, if, if vitamin C is a natural substance, I can't patent vitamin C. But if I have a new way of, of making that vitamin C, I may be able to, to patent that as a process. If I have a new way of applying vitamin C to cure some some syndrome, I may be able to patent that as a method or a process. So so methods and processes sit there next to those those material ones as a, as a different way of, of doing things. Uh, the invention uh, must be, in addition to falling into one of those categories, it must be novel, useful, and non-obvious. Novel means that it has not been, its details have not been released to the public or put in public use previously. Uh, uh, that is, is something to keep in mind if you're aiming to patent, is that, that you know, it, it can't be already out there. If it is, then, then maybe you can't patent it. There isn't one exception on self-revelation. If you're the inventor and you blab about it at a conference or publish it or, or put it in the product or go, oh, I should have I should have filed for, for my patent. Self-revelation frequently has a one year window for filing. If you're the actual inventor and you blab about it, uh, now the clock for, is running for one year. You may be able to still uh, put your thing in one year. Somebody else uh, invents it and publishes it in a different place. It's now called non-novel. It's been anticipated. It's not, not novel. So that's that's category number one, uh, criteria number one. Criteria number two, it has to be useful. Almost that almost every time it is useful because otherwise why would we spend the money to patent it? Uh, the one piece of this is, is is that it has to be specifically useful. So if I invent a new molecule and I'm sure it's gonna do something and I wanna get patented, but I don't know what it's gonna do yet. I can't really do that because it has to be have a specified use that will be useful. Um, and then the final one is non-obvious, and this is the one that's most subjective. Is that you know, would would, would somebody who who is a, a skilled in the in the particular art, as they call it in the patent law, um, would that person be able to give you that um, um, uh, that answer, that invention, if you just asked them? Um, uh, you know, all widgets are screwed in right-handed. It turns out they come loose a little bit. Uh, uh, in some uses, if we screwed them in left-handed, it would be um, um, it wouldn't be a problem. That would be obvious because uh, left-handed and right-handed kind of stuff is is going to just be, be be a fairly obvious change to do. Um, and as I mentioned, you can't do natural law or, or, or laws of nature or natural substances. It has to be an application of a natural law to do a particular piece of work, or it has to be a natural substance used in a way that 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 isn't isn't how it is in nature. 
the process is a lot of process involved. It includes in the application here, unlike copyright, we just have it here. You got to apply, you got to register for it. Uh, it's in complex and involved. The arguments uh, that, that you have to put on the table are very uh, technical about, you know, how it's used and what that, and how you state those arguments. Um, uh, getting some 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 legal help is 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 useful. DIY. I know people who have done their own patent applications. They get good at it and they they do it and they do it successfully. But it's not something you do trivially. It, it, um, um, I, I I use um, 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 TurboTax or or actually um, um, H and R Block version on my home taxes. Uh, I, I I'm cool. I can do that for my own income. I wouldn't do it for my company. You know, I wouldn't just you know, hey I, I can do it. Uh, uh, applying for a patent is a little bit in that kind of kind of league. It, it really some expertise can be quite helpful and, and and make the patent more effective and save some time. It does take time. You, the filing, and initial filing, and additional filings, and and uh, review of those filings by the reviewer. It can take um, a, at least eighteen months, probably, and often a, a, a few years. Um, complex drug patents may take makes take several years uh, to do. So again, that application process exists. It is something that, that getting some legal help at may be useful. That probably is useful. Next slide. Rights of the holder, you get a 20 year monopoly, uh, but only in places where the patent is obtained. Again, this international considerations. If I got a patent registered in the US and I haven't registered it in Germany, Germany's fair game um, for, for this, this work. And because it will typically be published when granted, if I haven't done international applications, then, then they know what I'm doing because I have to, in my application, describe how, how it's done in enough detail that anybody else can do it. So uh, this whole international strategy piece is a very interesting question because it's not cheap, uh, but it can bring, pull in extra uh, protections. Um, anyway, there we go. Um, uh, we can get an injunction, we get damages, border exclusions, the, the typical stuff we've talked about as, as the rights of the whole. Um, and by the way, the 20 year monopoly comes from filing now in the US, not from grants, so it's from filing. So, so it's gonna take a while, that's just the subtracting from the, from the, the 20 year monopoly. And in the case of, of, of an expensive to produce drug or something like that, that can be, be uh, quite significant in the, in the economic picture. Uh, defenses, defenses. Hey, first of all, avoid infringement. Uh, check existing patent landscape, which can be useful for uh, getting ideas as well. Interestingly, uh, when when we um, um, uh, 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 one of the defenses for 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 somebody being charged with patent infringement is the patent's no good, and this is a moment of real danger when 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 it's being brought. So go back up to offensive use cases. Um, um, uh, um, uh, why will you do it is it, it can, when available, can solidify a business line against competition or allow profitable licensing. It, it, it can be very useful uh, in uh, having a patent. Uh, but again, enforcing it can bring this little bit of danger that it might be invalidated in a challenge. Uh, questions on patent? Okay, let's move on to the next. I think we're, 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 we're reaching um, um, uh, 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 information fire hose fatigue here. Let me go to trade secret. Trade secret, tra as again, uh, they hear that the trade secret is not uh, a federal thing. And in fact, there's no federal trade secret office, but there are um, 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 uh, 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 some articles on, on it and you know, what you need to know and that kind of thing it can be quite helpful. And I've given you a resource there. Coverage and purpose, it covers protectable secrets. It doesn't protect the information itself. As I said previously, you got a patent on, on, on an invention, you own that invention, in, in, at least in the territory where you've got the patent, um, nobody else can, can, can infringe on it, there we go. Trade secret, once it's out, it's out. People can reverse engineer, people can do all kinds of stuff, uh, and, and it's out. There's no protection in the information piece itself. What you, is protection is against, um, uh, um, uh, against uh, improper taking through improper means, taken through improper means. Uh, and, and, uh, and to qualify it, it, the law covers protectable, profitable secrets. It has to be a secret, has to have utility and be profitable. It doesn't protect the information itself, as I said. So elements of protection, it must be a valuable secret, starting point. The owner must take reasonable precautions to protect it. it uh, in other words, you, you only earn into this protection if you're taking precautions. You leave the, the, the designs lying around on the, on the table in, in the, 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 the public waiting room, that's not reasonable precautions. You gotta keep the designs locked up. You gotta have password protection on the, on the computer aspect. You don't share it widely. When you do share it, you ask for an NDA. You get your employees to sign NDAs. Everybody, you know, we've got a contract web creating a, a, a protection against disclosure. We've got physical protection of, the, of the, the, the secret as well. All of those things come together. Those are reasonable precautions. So we have a profitable secret. We're taking reasonable precautions. Then 
we can sue if someone uses improper means to get it, either industrial espionage or corrupting someone with a duty not to disclose. And so improper means, and at least in the Vermont law, says theft, bribery, misrepresentation, breach or inducement of a breach of the duty to maintain secrecy or espionage through electronic or other means. Uh, drones, by the way, are interesting at this point. Um, uh, people flying drones around, is that improper means? We're going to see some more cases on that. Uh, next slide. Uh, precautions include, as I've mentioned, physical security, cybersecurity, NDA, et cetera. Rights, no time limit. Coca-Cola famously its formula is a trade secret because there's no time limit. If they'd patented it 20 years later, it'd be out there and everybody else would use it. As a trade secret, it lasts as long as we can keep it secret. Um, uh, but it is no defense against reverse engineering or independent discovery. Offense in use cases, it's not just technology, it's also customer lists, other valuable private information of the business. Uh, take the precautions. Uh, a classic case is, is a sales manager gets fired and runs off with a customer list. That would be a, 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 um, a, a potentially a, a, a trade secret violation. There. Also, you can use a trade secret against the person who hires that person and then improperly uses the information they took. It's not just did they steal it, but it's also did it get improperly used by, by some third party who knows that it's improper. So take the precautions. Defense and use cases, behave yourself and be careful with new hires. Because if you hire somebody who's going to now give you trade secret problem from a competitor, eh, you know, be a little careful in how you hire from competitors and what you do with that, with that person when they arrive. That, that's worth, you know, don't, don't trip up on the, on the trade secret piece. All right, next slide. So that covers our, 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 our review of the big four. Uh, I'd be happy to take some questions, but then we're going to dive back here in a moment in, in some of the services we, we supply and all. But uh, uh, any anything from the, uh, any any additional questions here? Simon? Yeah, just a quick question um, around trade secrets. So somebody that has a proprietary um, recipe or like a spice blend or a sauce or something like that, uh, would that fall under the trade secret? That could try to fall into the trade secret if it is truly a secret. You know, what's my secret sauce? As, as they say, you right, know, my right. secret sauce is secret. Uh, but again, I would have to, you know, get the get the agreements with everybody in the kitchen. Nobody's going to disclose this. I would have to get, you know, anybody who I, I, I shared the recipe with didn't did sign an NDA. I have to lock up that recipe. I have to make it behind closed doors so nobody can really see it. If I'm keeping it secret and it's a valuable secret. That is potentially uh, coverable under 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 a trade secret. By the way, a, a recipe is probably not coverable under patent because it's just thought to be you know um, okay. not 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 new enough. Yeah, I wondered about that. Is, would it be? Would you be able to protect it under some other uh, option? I, I would. Well, you can protect the name of how it's sold by by right. a trademark. You can yeah. protect your descriptions of it and and, and your write ups and its history uh, to some degree through copyright. You can't protect the underlying formula itself through copyright. You can't protect the underlying formula through trademark. You can't probably protect the underlying uh, uh, formula through patent because it's not going to be novel enough to, you know, mm -hmm. most, most food recipes are not thought to be novel. But every now and then, uh, some food technique, uh, there was that technique of aerating food and uh, making foams and things like that. That conceivably could have been, been maybe patented or elements of that. Uh, and uh, trade secrets kind of what you're left with. Gotcha. That's what I thought, but I thought I would clarify. Thank no, you. No, no. Again, the, while there are some other bits and pieces that are sometimes implicated, there's plant patenting and there's uh, design patenting and there's um, uh, uh, rights of privacy. There are other surrounding rights we haven't gone through. I've said these are the big four. They're not the only four. But basically, this is this this is your starting point. And if you fall into these categories, if you can put yourself in the bucket, cool. If you can't, there you go. Yeah. No, yeah, yeah. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Any other so, questions? Professor Clore, do you want to pick, pick up from here again? Okay, sure. There's been some good questions. Thank you very much. Um, so this is just the information for our program. We are the Entrepreneurial Legal Laboratory at Vermont Law and Graduate School. We offer access to legal services for small business owners. You can see some of the services that we offer here. The first two are really the ones that most folks who would be watching this would be interested in. Uh, we do individual educational consults with our team, and that includes me and Professor Goodenough and our students. Um, we can do those either on a quick term basis if folks have a flood related need or a, or short term uh, immediate need, or we can do a longer exploratory meeting where we can dive in really deeply into some of the legal questions that folks have. They are educational. They are not advice. For the advice part, we are able to find an attorney for a small business owner and we can pay the attorney for up to 10 hours of services that they receive. 
It's also possible for business owners working with an attorney if the attorney will accept our rate, which is a $75 an hour low bono rate up to 10 hours. They can always bring an attorney to us and we can we can pay the attorney for 10 hours of services. So we love to do that. We also, if there's groups of folks who have questions about common topics, we love to do group educational events or public educational events. Uh, and we always try to offer some helpful materials and links to resources for folks who really like to help people understand the law so that they can better navigate their business. And you can request services. You can see the address there at vermontlaw.edu slash CNPP. And I think that'll do it for the presentation today. Great. 